when we first started doing research, like you do some light Googling and the first thing that pops up is like terrorist sex cult, Roshnishis, you know? And you're like, I'm in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's Chapman Way and Mark Duplass talking about the new Netflix series, Wild Wild Country. Welcome to Pure Nonfiction. I'm Raphaela Nehausen, the executive director of Stranger Than Fiction and the Doc NYC Festival. I'm filling in for Tom Powers while he's quote unquote working at the Miami Film Festival. Truthfully, I'm not sure that counts as work, but in any case, I'm glad he's there because it gave me the chance to host Wild Wild Country's preview in New York. The six part series looks at a mostly forgotten conflict from the 1980s when the Indian guru Bhagwan Rajneesh and his followers created their own city, Rajneeshpuram, near Antelope, Oregon, and wound up clashing with locals. Everybody felt they were there at the beginning of the great experiment, like we were the chosen people. (laughs) I'm here in one of the largest ranches in the Northwest. Today, it's Rajneesh Purim, because a prominent Indian guru and his followers bought it. Our vision was to create a community based on compassion and sharing. Bhagwan's agenda was simply to raise the consciousness of humanity. That was his goal. America was land of promise. It was my conviction we will have no problems. I don't think America has a place for these people. Everyone in Antelope mistrust Rajneesh. I want that guru and his evil influence out of my city. They're run by satanic power. There is talk of vigilantes who may seek revenge on the Rajneeshis. A bomb went off in the middle of the community. More than 60 followers evacuated. It was a catastrophe. Mostly unjust, terrifying. If I didn't take measures to protect our community, no one else would do it. We call upon the governor to disarm this cult's army now. If the government does decide to get you, they're going to get you. The filmmakers are Chapman Way, who's 31 years old, and his brother McLean, who's four years younger. They tapped into an extraordinary archive documenting 300 hours of the Rajneesh followers, called the Sannyasins. This community dressed uniformly in all red. They were known for practicing free love, and that gave them a reputation as a sex cult. That didn't sit well with their neighbors in the tiny town of Antelope, as captured in a TV news piece at the time. There was a lot of talk as folks here in Antelope watched their new neighbors arrive. Then curiosity turned to concern when an ad appeared in a national magazine. Search the nooks and corners of your sexuality, a suggestion that makes townspeople nervous. This is the downfall of our civilization, the free love and this sort of thing that I disapprove of. We watch as the tensions escalate to the point where both sides are arming themselves. The sannyasins would ultimately be accused of poisoning, wiretapping, and immigration fraud on a mass scale. Legal authorities targeted Rajneesh's personal secretary, a charismatic and willful Indian woman named Ma Anand Sheila. Federal prosecutors in this country have asked the West German government to extradite Ma Anand Sheila to the United States. Sheila, a former secretary of the Bhagwan Rajneesh, faces charges of fraud and attempted murder in Oregon. Now, more than 35 years after these events, Chapman and McLean get key subjects on all sides to speak candidly, including a mesmerizing interview with Sheila. So the world has assassinated me and my character so often, I have nothing to lose. What have I to lose? Getting Wild Wild Country made took years. The Way Brothers had previously made only one other feature documentary, also set in Oregon. It was about a minor league baseball team in the 1970s, created by actor Bing Russell, the father of Kurt Russell. 
It's called the Battered Bastards of Baseball. There was no press handlers. There was no groomed image. There was just these furry, hairy, funny, great bunch of guys. And the things that happened on the field were absolutely insane. Organized baseball didn't like Bing, and they did everything they could to make sure Bing didn't win. So how did the Way Brothers move from a baseball documentary to a six-part series on a sex cult? They had help from executive producer Josh Braun, who was interviewed on episode 33 of Pure Nonfiction. Other executive producers are Mark and Jay Duplass, the prolific brothers who created fiction films like The Puffy Chair and TV series like Togetherness. Mark Duplass joined Chapman and McLean for a sneak preview of Wild Wild Country's first two episodes at Stranger Than Fiction. This conversation was recorded before a live audience at New York's IFC Center. McLean describes how the project started when they were researching baseball footage in the Portland archives. You walk into Portland archives, you see a whole bunch of tapes that say Bogwan on them and like Roshni's Purim. And so after a while, I was like, what's on one of those? And uh, we put a tape in and it was the 1982 World Festival, which was actually in one of the episodes that you guys watched. And pretty immediately it was like, wow, all right, I had never heard about this story. It's pretty, pretty remarkable. I felt like I hadn't heard about it. Um, and then, yeah, like he said, we got the footage back, and almost visually we were attracted to telling the story. It was like a bunch of people in red building a city in the, in the middle of the desert. It just seemed like... But then, like, as we started diving in, we started talking to, like, almost our cast. Like, there are talking heads and there are interviews, but they really act as kind of reliable and unreliable narrators to the story, which is part of the, part of the, part of the fun of watching the series, I think. Um, but I think the thing that unites everyone, Antelope and Roshnish and all of our like, Roshnish talking heads, was like, this was by far the most significant thing that had ever happened to them in their entire life. And they, were, they communicated that back to us. And so as documentary filmmakers, like, that was um, really interesting for us. And that's, like, that's what you kind of hope for when you reach out to people. And, I mean, I had never heard of the story. I'm not sure how many people here had. But it's extraordinary that this happened in the 80s on such a scale. And there hasn't been any other film that I know about it. So I thank you for plowing through your 300 hours of archival. Um, Mark, can you talk about what brought you to this project? I was a fan of The Batter Bastards of Baseball. I uh, really liked the movie. Didn't know who the guys were. It was just one of my like weird late night Netflix watches that I do, you know, roll through documentaries and I found it. And cut to like a year later, um, a really close friend of mine and someone I work with named Josh Braun, who's an executive producer. He's here in the audience. Josh, stand up for a second. Just stand up and say hi. So it's important, it's important to know that none of us are sitting here without Josh Braun. He, he had sold the guy's first movie and discovered them. Josh has sold the lion's share of all the work that I have done. Um, uh, he knew that I loved documentaries, but had no skill set to make documentaries. I was just a fan. I'm a narrative filmmaker. Um, and he got in touch with the guys, and they were talking about you know, how we're going to take this thing out and how we're going to sell it. And this was a little bit before like the boon of documentaries and and how true crime was having this wave that it was having. It was not quite as like sellable, you know. And and these guys were just dogged. Like we are going to tell this story. Um, and and Josh put us all together. Um, and it was this f funny joke at first of like the Duplass brothers and the Way brothers. And Josh works with his twin brother Dan, <laughs> a submarine. So is this is this Brothers Mojo project, um, and um, and so that's kind of how I, I came into it, and I had this good relationship with Netflix, and um, and they were you know kind enough to not only come aboard to distribute this, but to really specifically um, let us make this exactly the way uh, that the guys wanted to make it in particular, which was you know we could have hammed out on some of the true crime stuff, but there's an elegant cultural context to this thing that's a bigger story than just you know, all the things you are going to see, which are exciting, the, the weapons and the bombs, but there's something larger at play, um, and they really let us go to town on it. So um, that's what really got me excited about it. I mean, we were fans of Mark, like, from way back when, and I actually think that The Puffy Chair was the first film we ever streamed on Netflix, like, ever when they had only had, like, 10 films to stream. They, they, so, we were, like, yeah. one of the first 20 movies when, you, when, yeah. you left it, when you'd get it with, like, the speed was a one, you know? <laughs> and, uh, like, when... Uh, when we had, we're talking to distributors 
making the, the series, we had only done one feature before, and I, so I think that there was an understandable like hesitancy about like, well, we've never really heard of the story, and you guys want to do like six and a half hours on it, like that's a little crazy. Um, and we did struggle with that. That was one of like the biggest obstacles that we had when we first started on this, and then bringing Mark on board, it like literally was like that. <laughs> so I and went then, in the room and I was like, "Don't worry, guys, I'll make sure it's good," you know. And then I watched the first. They they came and they worked out of our offices. They became part of our family. Um, and I watched the first cut of this thing, and I was like, well, I'm going to show these guys how we'll make a documentary. <laughs> and then watch it, and I was like, I don't really have any notes. It's perfect. So, uh, all right, you're good. <laughs> and just to call out brothers, I did notice in the credits, and I asked you about this earlier, but your third brother is yeah. actually creating <laughs> music for this. Yeah, our older brother, Brocker, is an incredible composer. He's kind of one of our secret weapons um, and uh, really did a phenomenal job. And then uh, my wife was the incredible producer who wouldn't have been possible yeah. without either, Julie. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a, a family project that kind of the, the four of us dove into. So one of the things I really love about it is how nuanced all the characters are. And it's not very clear like who the good guys and the bad guys are, or you think you know, and then it changes very quickly. I was wondering, like, how did this process go for you? Did you start out thinking things were one way, and as you kind of dug deeper into the people's stories and the archives, like, did your own minds shift along the way? Yeah, it was kind of multi-layered. I think when we first started doing research, like, you do some light Googling, and the first thing up is, like, terrorist sex cult, Rosh Nishis, you know? And you're like, you're like I'm in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're like, that sounds really intense and kind of crazy. And... As soon as we started getting to know the characters and Sanyasins and ex Sanyasins, um, we kind of came across these really thoughtful, intelligent people who had had a lot of success in their previous life, were fulfilled for whatever reasons, and kind of joined this spiritual movement. Um, so that was kind of an eye opening experience. I'm someone who identifies as like very independent. I'm I'm not very spiritual or religious, so there was kind of a knee-jerk reaction on my part to dismiss them up front, but then getting to know them and what they wanted to achieve, what their goals were, what their ideals were, um, I feel like I learned a lot personally kind of in that experience. Um, and then the second thing was kind of like the ranchers. I mean, this is... Uh, kind of Trump town out there in, in Eastern Oregon. I think most people think of Oregon, they think of Portland and being a, a very liberal state, but Eastern Oregon's an entirely different um, kind of place out there. And so that was also kind of tricky to go out there and how am I going to connect with these people and you know what, 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 what could they maybe add to this story? And that was also another eye-opening experience where People out there had a lot of different politics. Some of them were Bernie supporters. Some of them were libertarians. Um, they all came from different walks of life and had their own issues with the Rosh Niche movement that were kind of all different. So, I mean, because the first two episodes are definitely it's antelope and Rosh Niche, but I got to say, like, as you kind of work your way through the series, the story just kind of gets bigger and bigger up to like the county level, and then eventually like the federal government gets involved and it kind of. But definitely these two episodes, it's like kind of just two groups right now, and then even on the back end, you see the Rosh Niche you start to kind of go in, in different directions themselves. But like as we got to talk to like Sanyasins, we would hear about these ranchers and antelope as just like very one dimensional characters that are bigots and, and racists out there. And, and they never tolerated us from day one because we wore, we dressed head to toe in red and wore a mall around our neck. And, and, and then we would go in the antelope and talk to people. And we kind of found out like, well, they are human beings too. Obviously they have a lot of different fears. And I mean, at a certain point, it's like Rosh Nishis were walking down antelope with semi-automatic weapons. I mean, and today I could imagine that those aren't welcome neighbors. Um, but then they would talk about the Sanyasins and they would be like, oh, they're, they're brainwashed. They're in a cult, you know? And it's like, well, that also wasn't quite our experience of them. Um, eventually, I think we just kind of worked our way through the story, trying to withhold judgment. Like from both sides, uh, that was kind of what ended up like really attracting us to the story, and I think it was intentional how we've kind of built this six-part series. Part of the fun, it's like I call it kind of detective work. It's not really detective work in terms of like who done it. I mean, we tell you in the first like ten minutes of the series, like kind of how crazy it ends up getting. Um, but the detective work is a little bit like where you draw your own lines between like cult and religion, and who was right and wrong, and should the antelopians have like rolled out the welcome mat, and if they didn't, then whose fault is that? Um, I think that's kind of hopefully part of the fun of watching the series.
And at, at the end, will you write an essay about what you really think happened and who's... <laughs> well, it's interesting. I, I have to say it's like, um, I guess if like the... If I, I kind of ended up with almost more questions th at the end of this process than at the beginning, and if that's like a failure as a documentary filmmaker, then we probably failed. But um, I think that we, we we are interested in trying to really like capture this element that the truth is probably a spectrum and it like lands on, somewhere on there. Also, it wasn't some like morally righteous thing. Like we're going to be super objective and show both sides. Um, it was really about capturing the journeys of our characters, regardless of, of how we feel. Um, and we do that with editing or score or how we're showing their perspective. It's not us feeling like we're good guys by showing both sides. I think there's just a magic in being able to drop into these characters' lives and watch the narrative unfold from their own perspectives. Um, and what was it like getting people to speak on camera all these years later? So the Sheila interviews, I mean, she is just a fascinating, fascinating woman. But even the attorney or the mayor, like, you really get people sitting down and remembering back to 1980 whatever, 82, and like, were all these people willing from the very first ask, or were any of them yeah, reluctant? I think, uh, people on both sides were incre incredibly reluctant to kind of talk. I think uh, for the people in Antelope, it was like an incredibly traumatizing four years that they went through, um, and they weren't really much interested in kind of rehashing it. Um, and then from the Sanyasin side, I think they feel like they've gotten burned a lot by the media and... and um, how they were portrayed in the media. And so for us to say, hey, we're not here to judge you for your ideals or beliefs or what happened. Um, we want you for the first time to walk us through what led to this mass poisoning of 750 people. And let's peel apart the Spoiler cultural- Spoiler alert, spoiler alert. <laughs> Be surprised on Friday. Yeah, the, 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 the cultural layers and the political layers. And you tell us from your perspective uh, how this unfolded. Um, and I think once they heard that they were they felt like they'd never really gotten a chance to do that. And I think that um, as soon as they started opening up, it kind of just came pouring out of them. And um, as the series goes, it gets more and more emotionally intense as they kind of walk through what happened. What Chapman means by emotionally intense is evoked by this interview with a Rajneesh follower, who today is a gray-haired senior. About this time, when one was called into Sheila's room in Jesus Grove, a list was being made of enemies of the commune. People were talking about killing other people. Sheila considered Mr. Turner a real enemy of the commune. Mr. Turner had the last say when it came to whether or not Bhagwan could stay in America. When there was talk of shooting people, Sheila had said, Shanti B will do it, she's a good shot. It was just put out there that, okay, I'm the good shot, I'll do that. Mark Duplass describes what it meant to get those interviews. I think when we first started talking about it, we were nervous about what you were going to be able to get because what we had when we sold this thing was um, a lot of really great archival footage. You know, you saw three, 300 hours of all that stuff shot on the ranch in the 80s, but we didn't have any of that uh, current stuff. So we had kind of taken a, a bit of a risk, you know, and it was a big testament to the guys who kind of very slowly and very gently listened and gained trust and would get a couple of interviews and then they'd fly back and get a couple more. And, you know, and, and they really... It was a long process of eventually getting everybody to come around and tell that story. Not everybody can do that. How long was the film in the making? Um, or the series, From rather? about the first time we started researching it to when we, when we premiered it, it was about four years. It was about a, at least a year of just research. I mean, there's been a ton of books and articles written on it, and so it was a year of doing research, reaching out to characters, um, and then it was about a year of production. We kind of filmed all over, all over in, in several countries, and then it took us about a year and a half to, to do the editing. Okay, so I have to ask, I work with my husband all the time, so what's it like to work with your brother, and what's it like to work with your brother? Like, how, how do the family dynamics play out in the edit room? Mark's a published uh, expert on this issue now. <laughs> yeah. Mark's yeah, got a book. It's, it's a hard question to answer. Like, um, my brother and I have been trying to answer that. We just wrote a 350-page book about it, and we still haven't figured it out. It's awesome. Um, what's it called? Um, I, I really, I can't say that, because then it looks like I was trying to promote it. <laughs> it's called Like Brothers. It is extremely rewarding because, um, you know, no one is going to know you like your, your, your sibling or your spouse will. And, um, you know, I also work with my wife and, and so I, 
uh, at the end of the day for me, um, I, I really like laying my head on, the, on a pillow next to someone who understands everything. I think if I were married to um, like a surgeon or a middle school teacher or a social worker, my filmic problems would feel really small <laughs> and I wouldn't be able to complain and get all the sympathy that I get. So I like being able to share that. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's really complex, but I, I, you know, part of the fun, just on, quite honestly, in working with these guys who are like, you know, about 10 years younger than I am, is like feeling the energy of when Jay and I were trying to figure out if we had anything to offer creatively, trying to climb the mountain of telling stories in an industry with, there's so many stories out there and, and, um, and, and you have that person to cling to, you know, um, that is it's just pivotal in my, you know, experience. Um, and so it's, it's, it's fun being around that energy for sure. Yeah, definitely. I think the thing that I've heard Mark say, which is totally true, is like there's so much work to do when you're making like feature films or docs or doc series independently that it's like, yeah, there's moments where we kind of like, if we do have a disagreement, we have a disagreement over something, but then it's, there's so much work to get done that it's almost like we both just tag team and kind of just like try and get a lot of things done and try and make this thing like in our lifetime. Um, there's a lot of work to, to yeah, kind of be done. They said they worked an hour, but like they worked weekends in our office. I, I like, I'm at the phase where I like, I bring my daughters to the office on the weekend to like, cause they like to play around and eat all the candy. And every time I went, on the weekends, one of them was there working on this. It's like, get out of my house, street. please. Yeah. <laughs> Will you like, leave? I was like, hey, it's, a, it's those guys that smell weird. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> Chapman had this to add. Yeah, I just I think uh, when you work he with He hates someone, his brother. He doesn't want to talk. <laughs> no, it's just, I think um, getting to like share the successes is just like really, really cool. It's something yeah. that... Um, like since you're little, you want to you want to do this, and so um, if someone just knows you really intimately and and can kind of share that that journey with us, it's just really cool, special. Out of 300 hours of footage, you've kind of culled it to its essence in these six episodes. Is there anything that you wish you could have squeezed in and just couldn't? Like, was there that one piece of archival footage that tickled you so much and you just wanted to include it and couldn't, or that one interview or that one soundbite? Or... Yeah, I mean, like, I, I kind of, we in the edit room would always be like, should we have asked for like 10, 10 hours? Which I know sounds really, I mean, every filmmaker is really precious about like the material that they work with. But I almost did think like if we could have, there's, there's actually a lot of like stuff, like it, it's almost, you I think one of the hardest things to edit in the series was the legal battles because those can get really dry really quickly. And like the one that we kind of went through in these episodes was the land use battle. And then episode three, I'm not, I don't think I'm spoiling anything here, but there's a big church state battle that gets launched and it becomes a real, Roshni's perm almost turns into like a constitutional issue. And then in episode four, the federal government gets involved and they start doing immigration um, investigations into Baguan and other people. And so it's like, there was this, fine line between like our, I, I find those interesting on paper they're very not interesting and how do you make them interesting because they're such a crucial part of the story um I think one of the things that we were really interested in is we tell it completely chronologically except for the first like 10 minutes which is kind of like a hook into episode one to hopefully draw attention to what this whole story is um but I, I think that ended up working out well or at least I'm, I'm proud that we ended up doing it that way because it's like I almost am happy that we just kind of almost lay it out there on the table and then this is an examination of like how it gets there, uh, which I think was like almost, I didn't even really realize that until we were like at the end of it. I'm like, oh, that's kind of how we ended up it's doing it. It's almost like you need like like a four hours of like obscure podcast to cover or the rest of it as like a companion sure. piece yeah. and we just call it like dork out. Yeah, like if you yeah, really want to dork sure. out and on all the legal stuff, like come yeah, into this the, one. The one thing that we always talked about doing in each episode and it was so weird because at the end of episode one, we're like, oh, well, we'll do it in episode two and then we cut episode two. Oh, we'll put it in three and it was the one thing we never got around to. I just, we couldn't ever find a spot for it but we always wanted to do what we called a day in the life section which is just walk you through what the average normal day was like for a sannyasin on the ranch from waking up to eating breakfast to having communal tea to hanging out to doing the disco at night and gambling and just kind of walk you through what this kind of adventure was for them um, and we just never we just never found a spot for it and so and have the people in the series seen the series were any of them at Sundance or is this still going to be a fun kind of yeah we um, we sent the series to Sheila um, before Sundance um, and uh, she seemed to enjoy it, so we were very, That's it. we were nervous about that. Um, yeah, she doesn't. Nothing bad happened to you after she saw it, so that's a good sign. Um, 
But She's yeah. not here. No. Well, yeah, I'm just curious. And, and, you know, yeah. we lose objectivity. You guys are two episodes in. Like, by a show of hands, who's feeling like pro Sheila at this moment based on what she's doing? It's kind of what I thought. I always get wrapped up in it. I know everything, but I, like when I remember sitting, I was sat and watched with you guys. I was like, she's pretty fucking awesome, man. <laughs> you got a dream. She's smart. She's a badass. Like, I really want to hang out with her. The Rajneesh followers had a practice called dynamic meditation. An audience member asked if the filmmakers had tried the meditation themselves. That's how they work out their arguments together. <laughs> we compete. We, uh, we wanted to interview the man that was, uh, had the vision of the city. He was uh, learned community building from Harvard, and it was kind of... City planner, he studied city planning, and this was kind of his concept with the nature and the water and the organic farming. And so he, he spends most of his time in a commune in Italy called Osho Miasto. And he said he would only talk to us if we went out to Italy and did the meditations out there with him in the commune. And so Mac and I said, yeah, why not? You know, So we flew out there, and we spent, I think it was four days out there. And now they wear all white. So we had to go to like a local Target and buy like white shirts and white pants. And um, we went out there, and we did the Kundalini meditation, and we did the dynamic meditation. Um, and it's very, for someone who hasn't done it before, it's incredibly awkward because it's a big emotional release. You're, you're screaming, you're yelling, you're jumping up and down. I wasn't in great shape, so I was <laughs> huffing and puffing. And you're, my personal experience was, I was like, this is kind of silly. This is where I feel really silly. Are people looking at me? And then about a half hour after doing the meditation, I felt very calm and very relaxed, and I was kind of enjoying myself, and I thought, oh, maybe there's something to this, you know? And so um, it was definitely an interesting experience getting to spend those four days uh, kind of with the community and getting to talk to a lot about them, about what drew them to Osho and, and Baguan and, and, and all, this, all that stuff. I mean, something that the guys uh, educated me on is that it is strange that no one in the state seems to know this story. I even like, I'm very close with my parents, who are you know in their 70s. My in-laws I, and I check with people, and they're like, I kind of heard a little something about it, but people seem to have missed this story. But but Osho um, and all across Europe is like it's like a phenomenon. Like it's so if you kind of talk to friends you have uh, across the pond, you will kind of probably get a different perspective on it. But, oh yeah, yeah, I know all about that and it's like continues still oh yeah, yeah are there any sannyasins or ex-sannyasins in the audience or no we've always had a handful at every screening no nope? okay so we kind of get to it in episode six but um Roshni's Purim doesn't last forever <laughs> so I don't know if that's a, a spoiler but spoiler they, really? yeah they end up going they, they, they in today in Pune India um they they always held on to that first ashram that they had and they've kind of re, re, remodeled it um and and uh it's kind of like a spa and meditation resort that um anyone can go to it's it's really no longer a commune which did create some controversy in the movement uh people don't live there forever anymore um so now it's kind of more of that resort type of business an audience member asked about the prominence of so many female leaders in the series. Chapman answers first, then McLean. Uh, obviously, it's very topical now. I think when we started this four years ago, it, it wasn't um, it, or wasn't as topical. Um, the, the community of Roshni's Perm was a matriarchy. Every, every single leader of every division was run by a woman, um, which was very, very interesting um, at the time. But Guan believed in, in putting females in charge. Um, getting to know these women, incredibly strong, incredibly thoughtful, incredibly intelligent, and also very in tune with themselves emotionally. So from a doc filmmaking standpoint, it was like you couldn't ask for better subjects because they were uh, very thoughtful and um, very provocative intellectually. Um, they, a lot of the things that they say in later episodes maybe don't align with some of the, the female movement stuff that's happening right now. And all of them had wildly different ideas um, and opinions on what was unfolding. Um, and so my viewpoint was, my takeaway was from that all these women really had their own sense of identity and understanding of, of what happened and that you couldn't just all group them together as uh, kind of one thought bubble. Yeah, and obviously Sheila is, I would call her definitely like our main character, talking head. Um, 
Uh, she's someone that stays with you throughout the whole series. Um, but I think for her, uh, I, we didn't even really talk about it directly with her because I think that you get it in the archive footage, but she was like 5'2 in person and she's small, but she's just such a, a big character. Um, and I think that in 1981 in Oregon, like this like Indian woman, small, but like feisty and ferocious, just like totally rocked that state of Oregon for like five years. And I don't think a lot of these like older white male politicians really like knew how to handle her or how to deal with that at all. Um, so it kind of created like a really interesting kind of storyline. And I remember talking to Sheila about that and she kind of gave me some, some interesting answers that we've kind of cut into the documentary. If you don't find the little loopholes in the law, it is, your loss. We started buying the properties in Antelope to secure our existence as a city. And we took over. I think we visited Sheila over three different times in Switzerland. Um, the first two were kind of just research trips and kind of to get to know you. Um, I think any kind of filmmaker subject relationship takes time to get to know that person um we kind of went in terrified because we only knew the archive footage and kind of what and what happens later um but uh, she was incredibly charming and welcoming and she has like a ferocious wit and she the more we got to know her the more um kind of comfortable we both felt and so the final of filming was we spent five days filming her and we did about four hours a day. And so we ended up with about 20 hours of interview um, by the time we were finished. Yeah, you could pretty much just watch <laughs> uncut. It's kind of amazing. Chapman explains what happened to Rajneesh Puram after the followers finally left. For those that don't know, um, when they pack up and leave to India, um, Dennis Washington, who is oil to make his money in oil, like, yeah, steel tra like trains and trains, in Montana. Uh, buys the whole property and then he kind of gifts the whole thing to Young Life, which is a Christian youth organization. It's one of the most popular uh, destinations for Christian youth in the summer to go and visit. Um, and so they basically run a Jesus camp out of there now, um, which is very ironic, I know. Um, and we have some footage of it, so yeah, it, it's, it's in there. <laughs> but it's not a cult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's funny. It's like, yeah, exactly. There's still a ton of sex. It just happens in the woods and no one knows about <laughs> exactly, it, so yeah. it's fine. <laughs> and they feel guilty. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, you are one of the first audiences to see this. It drops on Netflix on Friday. Hope you'll all check it out and tell your friends. Please help me thank the Waze Brothers, Mark. Thank you, thank you guys so much for coming. Thanks again to Chapman Way, McLean Way, and Mark Duplass for joining me at the IFC Center. You can watch Wild Wild Country and The Battered Bastards of Baseball streaming on Netflix. Thanks to our team, series producer Sarah Moto, sound mixer Tom Micah, and web designer Cross Strategy. Big thanks to Jeff Federson for lending us that emergency mic. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams, and I'm the executive producer Rafaela Nehausen. Pure Nonfiction is distributed by the TIFF Podcast Network. You can read our show notes, learn about live events, and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net. Thank you.